several weeks ago, my five-year-old son, Dean, uh, was just having some ear, ear pain discomfort. In the middle of the day, he just came to me and said, hey, dad, my ear hurts. And my son is pretty reactive. He's just five year old. And so his pain tolerance is pretty low when he's, when he's hurting, he, he acts like it's 10 times as bad. So when he came to me and was just really calm about it, uh, I was under the impression it was a, a pretty minor deal, which is what it turned out to be. It was so minor that really anytime he was doing anything else in the day, he would just forget about the pain. It was like, it wasn't there. And I had thought maybe it had gone away as the day went on. And then the nighttime routine came and we're laying in bed together. And he said, dad, my ear hurts. And still just really calm about the whole thing. Uh, really just seems like it's just some minor pressure or something going on. And I'm thinking, well, you know, it's the middle of the night weekend. The only real option we have is to go to the ER. And this does not seem like an ER visit type of deal. So I'm just going to process what can we do. And actually, a couple months prior to this, my my daughter, Maria at nine, she had something like swimmers here where she was in a lot of pain and just in the middle of the night. And we looked up kind of a solution, a home remedy, and that involves a, a white cider vinegar or white vinegar and some rubbing alcohol. So I'm like, hey, but I know what I can do. I'll go get some some of this. We'll put it in your ear and hopefully it will help. So I go get the, the white vinegar. And um, as soon as I get there, my son just panics, like just overcome with fear. He's screaming and crying and dad, I don't want to do this. And so much so that my wife, Jamie, she has to come in and we're just trying to comfort it. And she's literally holding him in her arms. And eventually we get him calmed down enough that I can pour the vinegar in his ear. And as I do that, this, there's just this, this moment where like, he just kind of realizes what's going on. And the fear just disappears. The tears stop. And he just is calm. And he's like, oh, that doesn't hurt. Actually, that feels kind of good. And he's just, just calm. And we wait five minutes to let it do its job, whatever that actually is. And then we go to drain his ear and some just dried up earwax gunk comes out thinking, hey, this is, this is it. We did the job. <clears throat> and he, he's like, oh, yeah, I feel a lot better. I said, okay, buddy, here's the deal. Now I'm supposed to put rubbing alcohol in. If there's any moisture, we want to draw it out. At least that's my understanding. I'm not a doctor. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But that's what worked for my daughter too. So I'm like, okay, but I got to do this one more time. And I'm thinking, hey, he's seen how this has worked. He's experienced the relief. This is going to be great. But no, he panics. Like, And it's worse than the first time. He's in this, this moment of pure uh fear of terror. And he's got that like superhuman strength. Now I can't hold him down. It's going to literally take, I'm going to have to climb up on the bed and pretty much put his lay, his head underneath my legs just to get him to hold still, which I'm not going to do. This is not life and death. This is such a minor thing. Eventually I just have to say, Hey, you know, but I'm, I'm done. Uh, you seem fine. We're all going to bed. And I was just struck. Here is my son. He's just moments before witnessed his parents caring for him. He's felt the relief of the stuff in his ear and then the pain that has gone away after this is done. And yet minutes later, he's struck by fear again. He has lost faith in, in what can happen with the, with the rubbing alcohol in his ear. He's lost faith in us as parents that we can take care of him and provide for him. All he can see is what's in front of him and how it makes him feel. And he is overwhelmed by the fear. And the truth is for you and I, for really everyone throughout our life, we come face to face with those moments. Despite the truth that we know, uh, maybe it's in relation to the people around us, our relation to God, we are overcome with fear and it's all we can see and it paralyzes us despite what we know. And so today we're going to take a look at this passage as we go through the book of Mark. We're going to look at, amongst other things, what does Jesus say about fear? And we're picking up right where we left off last week with Pastor Jason. Uh, Jesus and his disciples, they go across the Sea of Galilee. They have this big storm uh, that Jesus silences. And then they meet this demoniac, possessed man uh, with the multiple demons legion that he casts out uh, and, and really has him sent out amongst the Gentiles to proclaim the arrival of Jesus, what he has done for him. And now he's going to cross the sea again. That's where we'll pick up. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat, 
to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Jesus is, by all accounts, like a celebrity uh, amongst where he's living. Everyone, particularly amongst the Jews, wants to see him. As soon as he gets off the boat, he's just flooded with people who want to hear him teach, who want uh, healing from him. Everywhere he's going in this region, he's just swamped with people. And it says, then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, the synagogue, Jairus by name. And seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly. So here is, amongst this huge crowd, one man who's going to be called out by name, Jairus. And Jairus is particularly notable because he is a member of the rulers of the synagogue. He is a kind of Jewish leader. And what we've seen as we've gone in now five chapters deep into Mark, Jesus is having opposition with the Jewish leaders, particularly the Pharisees and the scribes, but not all of them are in opposition to Jesus. Uh, particularly this man, Jairus, he at least seems now willing, uh, due to the circumstances, to run, to fall at the feet of Jesus and plead to him for help. And it says, he was saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jairus just falls at Jesus' feet and he just, he pleads with him. My daughter, the most precious person in my world, she's about to die. Please, can you do something? Can you, Jesus, come and heal her? And it says, Jesus went with him. This is just Jesus's, you know, we don't hear him actually say it, but Jesus saying, yeah, I'm going to go heal this girl now. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And Jesus continues to be surrounded by the people. Even amongst this, he's like now going to heal this girl who's on her deathbed and he can't go there without just people. He's just pushing through the crowds. Everybody wants to have a piece of Jesus. Verse 25, and there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. And as Jesus is going uh, to heal Jairus' daughter, there's this other interaction that he has with an unnamed woman. And what we do know about her is that as she comes to Jesus, uh, we know the condition she is. Now, we don't, we're not 100% sure what is exactly going on, but the idea is most likely that she has just had this, this menstrual flow, this discharge of blood for 12 years straight. And it is just devastating to her. She is in a ton of pain. It says that she's just pouring all her resources into find some healing and there's nothing anyone can do. The most well-trained physicians in the land, they can't do anything. And in fact, she's not just like uh, staying where she's at. It's getting worse. As the years go on, things are getting worse. She's just tormented by this, tortured by just extreme pain. But that's not the only thing that's going on here. See, not only has she experienced severe uh, physical pain, but this is devastating all aspects of her life. See, what she lives under the Old Covenant in the Old Testament times, and as a Jewish woman, this would have had severe ramifications for her life. See, in this culture, in this religion, there was this idea of clean and unclean, kind of pure, unpure, holy, unholy, however you want to word it. And this, this particular condition, really actually all menstrual cycles, makes a woman unclean. In fact, I believe it's Leviticus 15, talks about for seven days after this, a woman is to remain unclean. But then the next paragraph talks about how a woman experiencing a continual discharge of blood is to remain perpetually unclean. And this has huge consequences for her life. So the idea of clean and unclean really doesn't have any uh, place in our society and our belief structure now. But back then, right, everything was kind of separated into this clean, unclean. And it really had to do with people's relationship to God. God was perfect and clean and undefiled and pure. And in, in a fallen world, we were often in in contact with things that were unclean, unpure, and that some of the confusion is that unclean doesn't necessarily mean sinful. There is some overlap there, but it just simply is a separation between the purity of God and the impurity of a fallen world. And often 
Unclean things have to do with death. Like if you were to touch a dead body, you would be unclean. They have to do with blood. Blood would make someone unclean. And really the, the big thing that this would do was make you unable to go to the temple to offer your sacrifice. Right? That under the old law, the Mosaic law covenant, a person would have to go and make a sacrifice in front of God to pay their blood debt for their sin. And she would be unable to do so because she was perpetually unclean. But this also affected her relationally. See, this idea of clean and unclean, it was transferable. So for her to be in contact, particularly physical contact with anyone else, would make them unclean. And being unclean is not necessarily sinful again, but part of the Old Testament was you're not supposed to be, you're supposed to do what you can to, be, to make sure you don't become unclean. So for her, for 12 years, she would have been ostracized by her community because nobody wants to become unclean like she is unclean. It would have affected if she was married, right? It, they were not allowed to have sexual relationships. It would have impacted their marriage. If she wasn't married, now no man is going to want to marry her because they can't bring forth a family. Right? For 12 years, she's an outcast. She's pushed away. People look down upon her. She's unclean. She can't go to the temple and be in the presence of God. Her entire world is devastated. And she understands the ramifications of this whole thing. She hears it says she had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. She just concocts this plan. She knows that she's not supposed to and probably can't, at least to her understanding, go up to Jesus or any rabbi or really anybody to, with the idea of, hey, can you just touch me to heal me? Because that would make them unclean. She has no business going to Jesus. She has really no business being in the crowd. So I, I don't know if it's exactly right, but I can just picture her like skulking through the crowd, hood up so nobody recognizes her. And she's like, I'm just going to touch Jesus's garment. Just touching his cloak is going to heal her. And that's exactly what happens. <clears throat> and immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him. And this is a really uh, weird uh, sentence that's the idea behind it is it's not just like she's come up with the secret cheat code of how to get power from Jesus. Like he's some genie. If you touch him right, he'll heal you. But really the idea that Jesus is complicit in it. He knows what's going on. He is allowing her to be healed. It's not that she's stealing his healing from him, but instead Jesus is involved and immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? Jesus stopped and he asked this really interesting question because I don't think he actually doesn't know. Right? We don't understand fully how his divinity interacts with him as a human and what he's capable of doing and not capable of doing fully. We get some picture. I don't, but what we've seen previously, how he can really understand the hearts and minds of people. I don't think this is a surprise. I don't think he's asking this question for himself. And what the disciples here is really just this ridiculous question. What do you mean who touched you, Jesus? Like, who hasn't touched you? You're amongst these people. They're always pressing in on you. You always have people touch you. What a ridiculous, ridiculous question. And yet he still asks it so that she will respond. And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. It's just a, this short story about how powerful the power of Jesus just freeing this woman from the suffering she has been experienced for over a decade. And there's just these two things that really about this particular part of the story that stand out to me. The first is that Jesus wants you as you are. Jesus wants you as you are. And when I say that, I want to be really careful. Not so you can stay as you are, but he wants you to approach him exactly as you are. This woman, like I said, she has no business going to Jesus. And yet she does it anyway. She's unclean. She's like all of us sinful. She has no business being in Jesus, God's presence. 
And yet that's what Jesus desires. And it's the desire he has for all of us. He wants you as you are. He wants you to bring your mess and your sin and all that you carry to him. The beauty of the gospel is that Jesus, right? Jesus doesn't wait for us. We don't have to make ourselves presentable to come to him. The gospel is Jesus comes to earth to us while we are unpresentable. And then when we repent and we turn to him, right, he justifies us in front of a righteous, holy God. He makes us presentable in front of the only true judge. And then he takes us and through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, he transforms us so that we truly become what he has made us, which is presentable, righteous, to look like him. That is the beauty of the gospel. He wants you with all of your baggage. He's not waiting for you to clean yourself up. If you're here today, right, and you're just trying to figure out all this Jesus stuff, you don't have to fix anything to follow Christ. That's not a prerequisite. He's gonna take you in the midst of your brokenness, in the midst of your son, wherever you're at, in the midst of addiction or failing marriage or failing family, you lost your job, you're just not enough, no one's enough. And yet he takes each and every one of us as we are. But he doesn't let us stay there. And that's a good reminder, not just for the people, kind of for those of you wrestling with what does it mean to follow Christ, but us as believers, for those of you who are in Christ, we came to Jesus just a broken mess. And I think what happens, I know for myself, right? I get in this, this idea, I'm a follower of Christ, and so I should look better, I should be better, I should look like him, and therefore I get to this point in life where I'm just we're still a broken mess, and I just want to hide. I want to hide in shame. But what the, what the Bible says is uh, there is no condemnation for those in Christ. That Jesus wants us to, to look like him. He empowers us to look like him. But day after day, moment after moment, he takes me. He takes you just as you are. He desires us to bring to him all of our mess and baggage day after day after day. And there's another thing that really stands out in the midst of this story. And it really has to do with a posture of Jesus, a posture of Jesus that we see really throughout all of the Gospels. And it's that Jesus was interruptible. Jesus was interruptible. It actually happens multiple times in this story and other stories. And it really has to do with this rhythm of life that Jesus created for himself. We see a man who in the midst of the most important mission of all time with this, this, this he's heading toward the cross. He's redeeming all of mankind and he's just unhurried. He has created margin in his life for the, the mission that he has, but also the people around him. The story starts off, starts off, Jesus gets off the boat. And what we know, what we'll see in the passage next week is he's heading back to his hometown. He has a purpose. He has a place, a destination in mind. And he gets off the boat and here comes Jairus and he stops right in front of Jesus, right? And he says, my daughter's sick. Can you come heal her? She's about to die. And Jesus, he has where he's going, but he stops everything to go with Jairus to heal the little girl. We come forward right now. He's he's on this this individual mission for Jairus' daughter. And this woman comes up and touches his cloak. And he, again, allows himself to be interrupted. The purpose he has in that moment is interrupted. I love that part. Immediately, he turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? This story is really interesting because it's not the format that you see with most of Jesus' healings. Most of the time when Jesus heals somebody, they come to him, they say, hey, Jesus, can you heal me? And then he said, yes, your faith has healed you, go, or some some form of that. But in this one, she sneaks up on Jesus. She tucks his, his, his garment without saying a word. She's healed. It seems like everything's done, and yet Jesus stops everything in that moment. He stops where he's going. He stops all the people around him and he searches out this woman. He searches her out, not because he has any more physical healing to do, but he has something more to address with her, right? She doesn't just need physical healing. She needs the healing emotionally, relationally, spiritually. And what he does is he just sees her. 
This woman who hasn't really been seen for, by anyone in a positive way for 12 years, he just sees her. He sees her hurt and he addresses her. Someone who would be pushed away by everyone, he just looks to her. And he sees her as an individual, someone in need who needs relationship. And he just gives her his time. And this is the posture that Jesus has throughout all of his ministry. Time and again, we see Jesus is interruptible. He has created a life where he has margin for the people in need, for the people around them, that he could set aside whatever his plans are to address them. We see it when he goes to pray and the disciples come. They're like, hey, Jesus, <clears throat> uh, the people are waiting for you. And, and he's doing something that's incredibly important. And he gets up and goes. We see it in the midst of his teaching, right? He's in the middle of a house and these dudes just wreck the roof to drop a guy in. And he stops his teaching to see the man right in front of him. Not to kick him out. Not how dare you destroy this roof, but instead he sees him. And that's what he does again and again and again. Jesus was interruptible. And I point that out because <clears throat> as we talk about what it is to be with Jesus, to follow him, to be ultimately his disciple, part of that is to start emulating him, emulating him in how he lives his life. Are you interruptible? Am I interruptible? Is a question I often wrestle with for myself. Am I interruptible? Because too often the answer is no. I'm absolutely not interruptible. My day is so busy, right? From the moment I get up to the moment I go to bed, I got stuff to do. I got kids to take care of. I got work to take care of. I got projects at my home. I got a wife that I want to interact with. I have animals that rely upon me. I have this thing and that thing and all that I want to do. And that's most of our lives. We are so jam-packed with things that we can't be interruptible because we don't have a second. We don't have a second to put aside our desires and our plans. But one of the most valuable things that we can do, one of the most important things we can do is we are a witness amongst the people in our lives is become interruptible. To be able to put aside the busyness of our lives to just see someone and hear them and love them and share the gospel with them. I was just thinking about how true this is and how just as I'm wrestling through this, uh, anytime I've been in just like the, a moment of crisis or whatever you want to call it, contacting a friend, right? And I've asked several friends over the years, like, hey, do you just have, do you have some time I could just spend with you and talk? And there have been moments where it's like, no, I don't really have time. But there have been friends in the midst of that, like, I'm really, really busy, but you know what? I'm just going to clear everything out. I'm just going to put it aside because hearing you, seeing you, listening to you, being present with you is more important than anything else. And what I have found in those moments, whatever good advice they give, the most memorable, the most important thing is that they cleared time for me. They were interrupted their busy schedule just for me. For to emulate Christ, part of that is to become people who are interruptible. We're going to go ahead now and continue. We're going to continue. And it's actually this, this story is going to shift back to Jairus. It says, <clears throat> while he was still speaking, <clears throat> there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? So here's Jesus. He's just stopped, right? He's been interrupted by this woman. And he's addressed her. He's now kind of teaching the crowd. Uh, and in the midst of this, Jairus, and I just got to be like putting myself in Jairus' space. Maybe this is completely wrong, but he's kind of got to be like, hey, guys, let's get going. My daughter is dying. Can we move this along? Like she's already got her healing and my daughter doesn't. Let's move. And out pops these, these, this, these people from his house and they bring news that Jairus, your daughter is dead. Right? Like, maybe Jesus could have done it. Maybe he could have healed her, but uh, he just didn't make it here quick enough. Don't bother him anymore. And we actually see kind of this interruptibility of Jesus. It says, but overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He just hears, he sees right deep down into the, to the heart and the mind of Jairus. And he just addresses him amidst all of this crowd. And then they're going to go ahead and continue on. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. So now there's just a small group now. He's pushed aside the crowd. They're going to go to the house. 
And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, that is Jairus. And Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing louder, <clears throat> loudly. So here it is. They've come upon the house. And this isn't just like mom in her grief screaming for the loss of their daughter. What has happened now is this is confirmation of the news that has reached Jairus. In, in their culture, this, there's a long burial process, which a lot of the times would, in, would, would require them to, to pay like professional wailers to come and just grieve aloud to let people know what was going on in the house. It's just part of their culture. These are paid people just putting on this show of grief for what has gone on. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. So here Jesus, right? All these people, all these show that's going on, not just them, but the family that's around. He looks to them and says, the child is not dead, but sleeping. And this is kind of one of those confusing statements. What's going on here? Because the idea is Jesus, I'm going to spoil the next little part. Jesus is going to raise this girl from the dead. So the idea isn't Jesus literally saying she's not dead. Instead, she's just like in a really deep sleep. Uh, He's pointing to something deeper. He's pointing to what's going to happen. And there's really two main interpretations of this. And I don't think either one of them are in opposition to each other. They both probably work really well together in that, I believe. And the first one is he's saying that she's sleeping really to draw attention to what he's going to do. He's going to raise her from the, from, from death. It's so much that it's going to be like she was sleeping, right? He's going to bring her up. She's just going to get up and everything's going to be grand. Like she just took a big long nap, but there's also this, this messianic secret, something we've talked about through Throughout this Mark series, that Jesus, particularly amongst the Jews, because we, we didn't see this when he went into the Gentile region, that he is kind of keeping a secret as best he can about who he actually is. Because he understands that ultimately he's heading to the cross and this is going to involve angering the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees. They're going to be the ones to put him to death. And so he's trying to to delay that, right? This is God's plan. All of this is going to happen in God's timing. And so this is just kind of this hey, this is, this is not going to be broadcast to everyone. In fact, what we'll see at the end of this passage is exactly that. He doesn't want anybody else to know what happens. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with them and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, <clears throat> Talitha kami, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Again, this messianic secret. There's, yeah, unless there's someone unmentioned, there's seven people, seven people uh, present, including Jesus and the little girl for this moment, this resurrection, just this incredibly powerful moment that through his actions reveals who he is. And this, this story, that's part of what it's doing. Pointing again, as we've seen throughout Mark, who is Jesus? Not just who he claims to be, but who is he revealing himself to be through his actions? And we've seen him heal sickness. We've seen him cast out demons. We've seen him have power over nature. And now he's come to the point where he has power over even life and death. Something that only God would be able to do, to have power. He brings this girl back to life. But what I really want to just take a moment as we kind of wrap up today is focus on this statement that Jesus makes in the midst of all of, uh, of, of healing this girl and the fear that Jairus ex- is experiencing. And it has to do with faith over fear. Immediately following, <laughs> immediately following Jairus hearing the news that his daughter has perished, that they haven't arrived in time, Jesus turns to him and he says just the really simple statement, do not fear, only believe. Do not fear, only believe. And what he's doing is he's really just giving Jairus, he's giving us the antidote. What is the answer to fear? 
And it's something that he's actually been repeating. Last week when we looked at the disciples on the boat in the Sea of Galilee, he makes a very similar statement in question form, but it ultimately points to the same thing, this idea of contrasting fear and faith or belief. That the answer to fear is faith, which honestly seems very contrary to everything I've learned throughout my life. Because I'm just going to go on a limb here, take a guess. If I went and pulled everyone, right, maybe Douglas County, wherever I could, I would think I would get a lot of answers about what is, what is the answer to the fear? How do you defeat or overcome fear? I think I would get something along the lines of courage or bravery or strength or, or, or <clears throat> just self-resilience, whatever it may be, stoicism. But all of them would point back to this idea of self, right? How we we overcome fear, we just dig deep. We grab on, we get our grit, and we just move forward through the fear, right? A fear is overcome by like self-determination. And I think there's a part of us, right? We desire to see that. Why do we why do I think a lot of us like like war movies? We want to see the hero. We want to see the guy overcome these odds where everybody else would shrink back in fear, but he's gonna stand up and he's gonna save people, he's gonna fight to the death when everybody else would turn around and run. But the reality is for each and every one of us. Right? We can access this courage or bravery sometimes, but there are areas in our life where there's no amount of self-reliance. There's no way we can turn to ourselves to overcome the fear that we were experiencing. Those same guys that we look to that could overcome the fear in the midst of battle, and they shrink in different spots in their lives. When they have a problem in their marriage, they just ignore it. A problem with their kids, they just let it go on or whatever it may be, something they see wrong at work or any aspect of their life, right? Where they can overcome certain aspects, just maybe it's predisposition, their their wiring, but the reality is each and every one of us, there are aspects of our life where fear will consume us and destroy us. And Jesus is pointing to this and he says, you know what? You don't turn to yourself to overcome fear. Overcoming fear is found in faith. He just repeated it. And anytime you're reading your Bible and you see something repeated, it's important that you probably take note. When he was on the Sea of Galilee with the disciples and they're in the midst of thinking they're going to die, Jesus is sleeping and they're like, hey, we're going to die, Jesus. Do you even care? He responds to them, why are you afraid? Do you not have any faith? He looks to Jairus when he's worried that now his daughter has died, has perished, that Jesus wasn't going to be enough. He says, do not fear only believe. It's actually a story you look at throughout all the Bible. God continually pointing to, yes, you will come into fear. There is going to be tons of bad things in your life. You are going to experience fear. You're going to be terrified, but the answer is faith. The answer ultimately is God, or now with Jesus arriving on, it's Jesus. The most, one of the most famous verses in all the Bible, Joshua 1, 9. Be courageous. Don't be afraid. Right? And it seems like, okay, there's the answer. Be courageous. But he gets to the heart of that. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It's not just be courageous. It's you can be courageous because Jesus, because God is with you. And that's what he's saying to Jairus right there. Everything looks terrible. Your daughter has died. But have faith. Because Jesus is there beside him. And it's the same thing for us. As we go through life, following Jesus isn't going to eliminate all the bad things in life. In fact, when I read through the gospel, it seems like the exact opposite is going to be true. But we don't have to fear. And when I'm talking about fear, it's that crippling fear that overcomes us, that terrifies us, that paralyzes us from doing the right thing or choosing to follow God or or stepping out of his calling in your life. And the answer is to place our faith in Christ. I'm going to go ahead and release the campuses. I love you guys. Thank you. Thanks for sticking around. Our transformational moment, we just have this question for you. Are you interruptible? Are you interruptible? What we see of Jesus is he is interruptible. He has a life, just a posture where he is going to stop and just address people, give them their time, love on them. As we're sharing the gospel, as we're living out the blessed rhythm, it requires 
an attitude, a posture of life that says, I am interruptible. And so I'd ask each and every one of us to really evaluate, are you truly interruptible? And if, like my guess is, the answer is mostly no, why is that? And how can you change that? How can you make a change in your life? Because this is deeply important. If we truly want to share the gospel, if we truly want to see people dedicate their lives to Christ, it's going to take something drastic, which is for us to become people who are interruptible. So are you interruptible? Thank you, guys. Bye.